This time we're going to resume the meeting of February 19th, 2019. Uh, Vice Mayor, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I'd be honored. <coughs> Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Roll call, please. <clears throat> Council Member Resendez? Here. Vice Mayor Richmond? Present. Mayor Velasquez? Here. Council Member Spencer? Here. Council Member Lenore? Present. City Manager Avra? Here. City Attorney David Prentice? Here. Chief of Police Westrick? Here. And the record will show Jason Epperson is absent. The amended agenda for the City of Hollister City Council regular meeting of February 19th, 2019 was posted on the bulletin board on February 15th, 2019 at 10.40 a.m. per Government Code Section 54954.2. <coughs> thank you very much. City Attorney, will you please report out from closed session? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We had uh, three actions. First action... Hollister versus Zendejas um, direction was given on that case. Uh, there was another case, uh, one case of uh, pending litigation. Um, it's a regulatory matter, and the uh, council uh, gave direction and approved a tolling agreement. And a manager evaluation, there was no reportable action. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move to the consent agenda. Are there any items the council would like to pull? No items. Is there items? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would like to pull um, A5, A7, and A8, please. Okay, do we have any from the public? I have none, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> okay, is there a motion? <coughs> I make a motion that we uh, approve the remaining agenda. Not that was not uh, pulled from consent. I second. Oh, I'm sorry. The remaining con on the consent agenda, correct? <clears throat> There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. We're going to move to item A5. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor or Councilman Richmond. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have, if not me. Um, David is here to, to help me if I need to, or Chief Westrick, sorry. <laughs> uh, the only question I have is, um, uh, do we have any kind of estimate of what the headcount would be on the overhire? It would just be one single um, officer for an overhire at this time. 
Uh, okay. Um, thank you very much. That was the only question I had. Um, I make a motion that we approve. Is there Hang any on. other question of Hang public? On. Do we have any uh, speaker, speaker cards on that item? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, is there a motion to approve? I'd like to make a motion that we approve A5. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion Aye. carries. We're going to move to item A7. This time I'm going to recuse myself from this item since I own the property next door. And we'll pass the gavel to Vice Mayor Richmond. Thank you. Besides myself, is there anybody else who would like to speak on this item? Item A7. <coughs> Any members of the public? I have nothing, Vice Mayor. My question is, what what did we finally uh, decide in the end uh, was the fair cost of the parking for per, well, per, as, per space? We have a preliminary estimate about of about roughly $32 per space per month. This was based on looking at the use of the facility, the bills, the actual bills over the last three fiscal years. But the agreement stipulates that a qualified fiscal consultant derive that cost and that it's to be reviewed every five years and that it would be based on the section of the parking garage that is not used for right now it's leased for Gavilan and, and it's also used for city offices so it would be those portions of the parking garage that are used as a parking facility that would include the elevator and the doors the the garage door all those if then if the parking facility is left open then that would be a different maintenance overhead than if it's closed and that would be at the discretion of the city council whether it's opened or closed so it will be based purely on a proportional number of spaces based on the cost for the entire spaces in in the parking garage is that correct, correct? yeah okay any other comments no okay Mr. Vice Mayor, if we could take a roll call vote on this item. Of course. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Res Res uh, Council Member Resendez uh, requests a roll call vote so we can, uh, I'll make a motion first. I make a motion that we uh, approve item A7 as, uh, as detailed by uh, um, Ms. Paxton. Uh, roll call vote, please. Uh, do I get a I'll second? second Sorry. That. Thank you. I have a second. Council Member Resendez? No. Vice Mayor Richmond? Yes. Council Member Spencer? Yes. Council Member Lenore? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. 3 1. Thank you. And thank you for getting the mayor. A8. Okay, we're going to move to item A8. Public City Clerk. Is this your item? No. Do you have a question? This I believe brought it's from a, uh, uh, Oh, yes. Richmond. Yes, it is. A8 is mine. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I have a comment. Uh -huh. I try to use uh, this system twice uh, in the last two days, and it was just like moving through molasses. Are you talking the agenda management system, or are you talking going through web link into LaserFish? The web link and the LaserFish. It was... It was uh, is this not the, the laser fish item here? Yes. This is the laser fish says. item. Yeah, yes. okay. Um, it would take, and I don't know how many people were on on the holiday. It's impossible for me to know. But I'm going to assume there weren't a lot of people on on the holiday. Uh, 
it might take somebody a year to go through a couple of a couple of couple of pages at the rate it was moving. That might be a problem with the laser fish. It might be a problem with our broadband. Uh, I don't know, but I can tell you that I also did several searches of words that I know are in there because I had the document in front of me, and those searches returned nothing. They consistently returned blanks and said there was no thing. So I don't, you know, we're going to pay for an upgrade. We paid. Uh, for oh, we an paid up for, an upgrade? paid for an upgrade. Uh, and uh, basically, this—the reason I'm bringing this to council now is because the um, maintenance for it has gone up by about two hundred dollars a year, and I just okay. wanted to make that clear and, and as part of the contract. But we have not gone through uh, the formal training after the upgrade. The upgrade was done while I was actually training on the workflow okay. and other portions of it. So um, I don't know if we have the public portal up yet and i think oh. that the, there's a public portal piece of it so i'm mm -hmm. not sure what all of that training is going to entail and i'm waiting to hear from ecs which is our our value-added reseller for laser fish to um, send me dates and I'm, I'm not sure if it's web link or if it will be personal training on how to set up the portal and even have access to some of the things that I learned while I was at training, like the workflow and the forms and that kind of a thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that if it's not easily available to the public, they're, they're just not going to use it. They, they have no, most people don't have, the, you know, I needed the document, so I just sat there and waited and waited and waited until I could, I could slug through it a page at a time at, at the slowest possible rate. But my guess is the public is not going to be that that patient, and if they need information, uh, you know whatever do, whatever percent of them need information, if that doesn't work any faster than that, it's not going to satisfy me for public information. That's all. I just wanted to get a chance to input that. It may be that that's not fully implemented yet. It may be that it's not tuned up yet. But but the day they walk out and say we've got it all fixed, it, it's got to. <laughs> It's got to run better than that. that yeah, I agree. That's my only I, I do yeah. know that, um, I don't know if you've had act time to go on to the agenda management system, and I think that that's faster, oh, downloading okay. and getting our agendas and agenda packet portions. But honestly, since I've been back, I've been playing catch-up, so I have not had a okay. chance to access it from the public part of it and to go in and play with it. So I'm hoping to have some time either later this week to, I, to try that and see what the public's seeing. I just wanted to give you my, my personal experience. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay. Is there any other questions or comments? Do we have any speaker cards on this? I have none. Okay. Is there a motion? I'll move that we adopt resolution number 2019-33, um, awarding the, approving a contract with ECS Imaging for Laserfish Avante Software. Okay. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much. We're going to move on. If you can, if it's all right with the council, we can move item G4 up. We have a speaker from LAFCO here to do a presentation on how LAFCO works. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, council members, for inviting me tonight. Thank you. Um, I do have a PowerPoint that I would like to go through. I'm not sure who operates that. The one thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> right, a tighter. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Thank you. I, I had a handout also. Yeah, um, <clears throat> again, my name is Bill Nicholson. I'm the executive officer for LAFCO, um, pretty much the only staff for LAFCO beyond the board clerk of the county, which provides support. Um, and I'm going to get into a presentation of the role and responsibility of LAFCO. Um, and the city, of course, is a part of LAFCO, as is the other city in the county, San Juan Batista, and the Board of Supervisors are a part. And um, anyway, so, um, oh, great. Okay. At the computer, okay. It's a game we play with all guest speakers. Is it okay? <laughs> Is it just the right? It's so exciting now. Now it goes. It's moving now. 
Just oh, there we go. Yeah. Now it's flying. It's okay. <laughs> kind of worse like that laser fish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's going a little slow. All right. So hopefully this is the first slide. Um, yeah, the, I'm going to start off with the purpose and then the, the membership and the responsibilities of LAFCO. So um, LAFCO was reformed by the state uh, back in 1965, and every county in California has a LAFCO. And um, the purpose of forming LAFCO is were to encourage logical and orderly boundaries. And one of the key examples that the state was trying to address at the time was cities like San Jose, which kept annexing down Highway 101 to grab the next interchange and the next commercial development, and they would go another mile and grab the next one, and you know, it was impossible for them to provide police and fire service um, running down a highway like that, let alone sewer and water. So um, that example was, was common around the state, but San Jose's always referenced as one of the, one of the bad guys that helped um, cause this entity to be formed. Um, the other uh, m uh, purpose, main purpose is to balance urban development or urban growth with the sometimes, and this is out of the law that they used to, the term, sometimes competing state interests of discouraging urban sprawl, conserving agricultural and open space lands, and efficiently extending government services. So um, you, you have all of those issues right here in San Bernardino County and Hollister. Um, how do you extend your sewer and water? Um, how do you provide adequate police and fire? And um, you have great farmland, and how do you conserve that? So they say they're sometimes competing, but it, really they're always competing um, in a community like this. Um, and then also they have, over the years, they've added other factors to look at, such as regional housing needs, um, adequate water supplies, or special um, factors to, to investigate in water. Um, they created a um, category of disadvantaged unincorporated communities um, that uh, many times cities will annex farmland but leave the county unincorporated areas <coughs> behind, and they may be um, underserved and, again, typical around Hollister, people on septic tanks on small lots, and the city grows out past those. And um, so LAFCO is now, under more recent law, any annexation over 10 acres, you have to look at is there a disadvantaged community, which is basically a low-income community that is underserved with sewer water or uh, fire protection. And LAFCO is supposed to have the city include those <coughs> into the annexation if uh, those communities are next door to the annexation area. <clears throat> um, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, LAFCOs, again, every county has them. <clears throat> LAFCOs are independent. They're not part of the county. They're not part of the city. They're not from the state. They're, they're enacted locally um, under the authority of state law. And uh, there was no appeal of a LAFCO decision, only a reconsideration period of 30 days, and then LAFCO can reconsider it. But after that, the only option is to sue if, if someone felt LAFCO broke the law. Um, it's considered a legislative watchdog for local government efficiency. The state gave a mandate for LAFCOs to prepare municipal service review documents to study cities and special districts and their budgets. Um, county service areas are included in that, um, and on a regular basis, look at those issues um, on a local, again, on a local level, not, not the state looking at it. And then um, the executive officer in my role is I'm solely accountable to the commission and so the commission's, um, we're going to get into that, the membership, but I, that's my boss. It's, there's no uh, county person or city person independently that, that I answer to. And I, we um, are governed by the cordesi knox Hersberg Act, um, which is a, a nice document that's pretty concise on, on annexations and boundary changes and formations. So um, that's, that kind of drives our decision making. Going to the next slide, I think. Okay, so in each county with two or more cities, you have um, a regular and alternate member from the city council to be appointed by the city selection committee, and there's a reference to the government code for that. Um, and then that section is 50270, which states that the city selection committee's purpose is to appoint city representatives to boards, commissions, and agencies. And the membership of those city selection committees are the mayors of each of the cities in the county. So the, the paperwork I handed out um, was that part of the Cortez Knox Hersberg Act, this, this law governing LAFCO, that tells you how you appoint the, the county members on LAFCO, which is the Board of Supervisors. They, they decide who they appoint. Um, for cities, 
um, in your case, you have two cities, so it's a little simpler. But in counties like Santa Clara next year, when you have 16 cities, um, to reach agreement for the two seats they get, they actually changed the state law and got a third seat for cities with San Jose always on. And they, they paid for it, but they, they have an extra seat. But otherwise, many counties have multiple cities, and you've got to decide who's going to get on. So they let the mayors um, meet and decide that through the selection committee. And those meetings are um, public meetings. They're subject to the Brown Act. An agenda has to be prepared. And the um, board clerk is the clerk of the selection committee in every county. And I think, um, yeah, I slept. I, excuse me, I skipped over a slide because of the trigger here. Um, there's two appointed by the board of supervisors, two appointed by the city selection committee. <coughs> excuse me. And the public member appointed by the other four LAFCO members. And then each, each category has one alternate member. Looks like it's faster going backwards. <clears throat> okay, then in ter terms of composition, um, they also, the law also states that the members, when they come to a LAFCO meeting, are there to represent their independent judgment on behalf of the interests of the residents, property owners, and the public as a whole in furthering the purposes of LAFCO. And this is in um, quotes, any member appointed on behalf of local governments shall represent the interests of the public as a whole, not solely the interests of the appointing body. So when you come to LAFCO, you put on a LAFCO hat and you take off your city council or your board of supervisors hats. Some LAFCOs have special districts. And again, if you're from a water district or a, a conservation district, you take off that hat and, and look to the LAFCO <coughs> law for your decision making. So it's hard to do, but that's, that's written into the law. That's the goal. So it's a little sticky here. OK. Um, so again, uh, the commission uh, regulates boundaries of public agencies and the creation of new agencies, such as formations of a new county service area, a new special district, um, periodically incorporations of a city, even. Um, you approve the boundaries, expansions, like annexations, if they're consistent with the sphere of influence of the agency. And spheres of influence are established by LAFCO, not by a city or a district. Um, the um, public services extending outside the city limits or a district boundary also need to come to um, LAFCO, and there are certain limitations of when LAFCO can approve that. Um, but LAFCO is prohibited from directly um, determining how land use um, occurs and how development occurs. So LAFCO couldn't say, we'll deny this annexation for um, commercial development, but we'll approve it for housing, or we'll approve the housing if you change the number of units to some other number. Um, LAFCO can't get into the land use side of it. Um, just the boundaries and public services and, and those, those kind of issues. Sorry, yes. Yeah, okay. So, as I mentioned, we, we have to adopt spheres of influence, and we're supposed to look at them every five years or as necessary. So, um, the city of Hollister is actually way behind that we've uh, looked at your sphere of influence. Um, we also prepare municipal service reviews, as I mentioned, on government efficiency, and that hasn't been prepared for the city um, in since 2007. Um, I think your general plan or your sphere was. Um, 2006 with your last general plan. Or actually, the sphere is older than that. Um, and then, um, historically, there was an urban service area within the city of Hollister's planning area, and that was taken away in the mid-'90s, I believe. But there's, there was another <coughs> boundary that if you created a five-year growth area, the city could annex it without coming back to LAFCO for those specific properties. So now, instead of all the text, I have some maps. So here, you should be familiar with your general plan diagram. And I, I want to get into just some of the graphic representation of what the LAFCO um, law reflects. So here's the state uh, Office of Planning and Research um, general plan guidelines diagram, which shows you the gray area being the city limits. And then the next dashed line around that is the sphere of influence what you, you would plan to grow into, and that would be analyzed in your general plan. And then the boundary after that is basically you call your planning area. 
and it would be an area typically that you have an interest in or maybe the county is doing something or you're concerned about the county approving some uses but you don't plan on annexing or providing services to it. So that's kind of the, the model in California. So locally, and this map um, is hard to read, uh, but this is a map that we prepared for our, or I prepared for the meeting we had um, last month at LAFCO where we were amending the sphere of influence for the city for the Chapel Road area. And right in the middle is a red uh, kind of candy stripe, candy cane stripe um, property, which is the Highway 25 bypass and the area east of Chapel Road. It was uh, 102 acres. And that was added into the sphere of influence. So if you look at this map, you'll see the outer boundary is the planning area. And there's an inner boundary that has a little um, sphere of influence um, sign, little red notes. But um, is there a laser pointer on here? Oh, it doesn't hit the screen. OK. Um, there's the next boundary is the sphere of influence. And then, of course, you have the city limits. So you're kind of following that state um, guidelines. And this is, without that area being highlighted, it just shows the sphere of influence on a little bit better. And yeah, I can't put the, the laser pointer on the screen. But um, the, the problem that we have as LAFCO for the city and the city complying with the sphere of influence concept is in your general plan, you have areas designated for development from your 2006 general plan that go beyond the sphere of influence. So typically, when a city does a new general plan, they'll identify a sphere of influence that they would like, but then they submit that to LAFCO and ask for LAFCO to expand the sphere to match that new urban boundary. And usually cities grow, so the boundary usually gets extended out. Not always, but, but most of the time it does. But back in 2006, the city, the city never came back to LAFCO and said, hey, we'd like to expand it. So now you have projects like at Chapel Road where you want to annex, and we have to mend the sphere of influence with that annexation across the street or on the other side of San Felipe was the Allendale annexation up on the hill, and that one also needed a sphere amendment. So over the years, you're coming up now against the edge, and you're, you're having to amend your sphere for areas that you already designated for development in your general plan. There's housing areas and commercial and industrial all meeting that. So um, I do want to commend the city, and I'm really excited about this, that you're, you're initiating your general plan update and um, definitely including LAFCO in the process, you know, regular communication would be important uh, to look at the LAFCO issues as you're going with the general plan so you don't prepare a general plan and propose a sphere that's contrary to a lot of the issues that we have, again, of agricultural protection, um, public service um, efficiencies, and issues like that that um, would be better if, if we kind of work together. Um, you, you know, you have your interests, but we have interests. But if we you update your general plan and then submit the sphere, then we'll all be on the same page because now we're it's kind of piecemeal, um, one at a, you know one project at a time. We're kind of addressing because you, you're filling up. So it's a, I really commend you on it, and it's and it's a great opportunity. And you know, many new city council members, it's a, a great place to be um, moving forward. And this is just a representation of another um, boundary that we deal with, um, which is unique to the San Benito County, which is a Hollister urban area, which is outlined in yellow. And this yellow boundary is highlighted on the county's general plan for the northern part of the county, and it goes well beyond the city. The white area is the current city limits, or actually city limits as the time this was um, prepared in the county's general plan about 2013. Um, but it also includes the county areas around the city. And what's interesting from this map, except to the northwest, the upper left, and around the airport, which is green, it's, a, it's an olive color here, um, which is ag, everywhere else around the city is all designated orange or yellow, which is all urban development. So the county's got you covered. The, if you're not doing it, the county is doing it around you. And many times you'd have, a, a within the sphere of influence, a county, um, maybe urban reserve or area that they're not going to develop and the city is going to grow into that area. But now it's kind of like if you don't do it, the county will do it. And the way that they can develop is with the city's sewer. So we have an issue at LAFCO with the city extending the sewer out into the county without annexing it. And um, this Halster urban area is the, is the basis for that decision uh, having been made years ago. Um, but there's some conflicts with the LAFCO law and how that's administered. So besides the city growing and annexing, and besides moving your sphere of influence, then we have a day-to-day -day kind of issue of there's a development going on in the county, 
And I know you, there was one recently that wasn't going on city sewer, and the city didn't like that either. Not new septic systems in your sphere. Uh, but then the other side of it is developing at urban densities like city densities, but in the county right in your backyard. And that's usually not desired either. It, it would be safe for the city to uh, develop. So those are all challenges for LAFCO. And again, LAFCO is made up of the county and both cities. So, um, and a public member in the audience, Richard Betcourt. Um, so we, these are the issues that we keep coming before us and perhaps your general plan update can help address that and part of the co cooperation and coordination with the county. Um, so I'm almost done here. Yeah, this is just the provisions for the extension of services outside the boundaries. Within your sphere of influence, um, you're, we're allowed to do it if you're anticipating annexation in the future. And we would implement that by getting the city to enter an agreement with the landowner that they won't protest. They won't fight an annexation in the future when the city's ready. And that's in return for getting sewer or water from the city. The other option is when it's outside the sphere of influence, there has to be a threat, an existing or an impending threat to health and safety. So we've had a mobile home park our, yeah, area um, just north of town that's got bad water and the city's agreed in getting grant money to provide uh, water to that property which is really good but the development's already there and which is different than a new development on ag land brand new and the city would extend service to it there's no health and safety emergency so those cases it should be within your sphere mm -hmm. and that's we've talked with your city manager many times about it and have many discussions at LAFCO about that so um, those are the two two ex exceptions that, that are under the law, that, or excuse me, the, the two paths to get there. There are exceptions under the law um, that have, the LAFCO has actually found a couple times that these projects were exempt and there's, those are debated at the commission as well. So, um, but that pretty much wraps up my presentation. I, I think I just have the general plan map again, but, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank thoughts. you very much and I want to thank you for coming out and answering or doing a presentation of how important LAFCO is. I'm the one that invited you to come here because there's been some conversations happening through some of the lobbyists for the developers recently of how to force me to vote affirmative for some of these projects. And I voiced my point of, no, when we go to LAFCO meeting, I wear a different hat and I represent the public, which I thought was very important. And part of what LAFCO is all about. LAFCO is really is about, as you point out, preventing sprawl, leapfrog development. And I'm very passionate about making sure we don't make the same mistakes over and over. So I want to be clear. I can't be forced to vote a certain way, correct? correct. As a member of LAFCO. Right. Nobody can come back and say, you have to vote this way or we're going to remove you from this board. Yeah, the, the City Selection Committee appoints the city representatives on LAFCO, and that committee, again, is made up of the two mayors. So um, to get to the mayor, you've got to change mayors. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be clear about that because this conversation, let's get them out so we can get that vote we need for the sprawl we want. This is, again, why LAFCO is here. It helps protect our community. The other thing I wanted to be clear about is we did have an incident last year where we provided services in an area where legally we shouldn't have been. So if it's not in the sphere of influence, we should not be providing services. In For new development. Right. Without creating an exemption somehow, which is, again is one of the reasons we keep having problems. It's always an exemption, a way around the rules. And again, I think a well-planned community doesn't look for ways around the rules. It works with the rules that we have. And there are so many examples of communities that have failed in this aspect by looking for ways around. San Jose, you can have that conversation with many people that came from San Jose 30, 40 years ago will tell you. And you can find communities that have done it well by implementing some of the rules and staying with those rules to make sure we don't have a leapfrog development, which ends up really hurting our community through traffic issues, infrastructure issues. It's a very important role LAFCO has. And I think rather than for some of you that are out there and are looking for ways to change the rules for more growth, 
we should look at it as a way to help protect our community and do our growth in a more positive manner. And that's what these committees are all about. And these lab code plays a very important role. So I wanted to thank you again for coming out and helping explain that. So hopefully we can move past this and work on that general plan update and we start doing this right. So thank you very much. I have a question for Mr. Nicholson. Go ahead, Ms. Lenore. Uh, your slide did say, I want to clarify, that the member on LAPCO is prohibited on deciding how the, when they vote, how the land is used or designated, correct? Right. So they're not supposed to consider the use that's going to maybe occur there. There you're supposed to consider the services and the extending of the sphere of influence and not necessarily homes that are going to be there in the future, correct? Yet yeah, you have to consider what's proposed, of course. So you're you're the, you're proposing you're to extend the sphere of influence. You're not proposing to approve a tentative map. Yeah, you're not approving a tentative map exactly. So you can't make decisions right. based on land use. Right. Okay. You can't. Well, you can't change the land use. You you do look at an annexation, and I'll give you an example. The city city of X annexes land every year, and they annex thousands of acres. And pretty soon they have all this land extending way out, and they're not building a lot of homes. So they come back to LAFCO the next year, and it's the same kind of project. And LAFCO isn't saying, well, um, we don't like this project for so many homes. It's that you have all this land, you haven't been building. It's not time to approve this project. You have too much um, land for, for development, and so we're going to vote no. Um, it was a housing project. Um, but the, you look at how much they call it a vacant land inventory. How much vacant land do you have for that use already in the city? And if, if the growth rate uh -huh. is 5% and you got 20% worth of land, you could, the LAFCO could vote no because that use, uh, you have an abundance of that supply. Too much inventory, yeah. So you're not picking on the project saying, we don't like this project, we don't like the lot layout, we don't right. like the style of homes, and like you say, the tentative map. Change, change these configuration, but you could, you, you have to look at is it commercial, is it industrial, is it residential, and where, how does it fit, how does okay. it relate to ag land, um, how does it interface with um, existing development or future development. So you, you get into land use kind of on the side, you don't ignore it, but you have no authority to say if you change this to another use, we'll approve it, or if you, okay. if you change the design, the layout, we'll approve it. Okay. Yes, yeah, just to clarify. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Richard? Thank you. I'd like to make a little speech, too. Um, I was the one who thought the mayor had to vote the way the city council vote. I am not a lobbyist for anybody. Let me repeat that. I am not a lobbyist for anybody. I never took a dime from any developer, not even a cup of coffee. I resent being called a lobbyist because I thought the mayor had to vote the way the city council voted. I checked the law and I found out I was wrong. He did not have to vote the way the city council voted. And I told him I checked the law and I was wrong. To call me a lobbyist for somebody because I disagreed with him, that's nonsense. I'm lobbying for no one. How about your other members of LAFCO? Can they vote their conscience? They're all supposed to vote their conscience. Exactly. Every member? Yep. Are any of them lobbyists for developers that you know of? No, I have no idea. Okay. So just because they happen to disagree with the mayor's vote, does that make them the devil incarnate? <laughs> Are they running around with a pitchfork because they happen to disagree? I believe the majority of members all of which were voting their conscience, happened to vote yes. Isn't that correct? On the last time you guys had a, a uh, some land to uh, to annex, isn't that correct? Yeah, I would feel that the commissioners were voting their conscience. That's right. They the all voted the their debate. conscience, yeah. and they happened to vote yes. No one came up with them and said, oh, you're the devil because you voted yes. They were entitled to vote yes, just like the mayor's entitled to vote no. So I didn't like what happened during that meeting, and I'm sure you understand that. I don't like being, them being accused of, of being working for a lobbyist or being a lobbyist for developers or any other thing. Besides, they did not ask to put any housing down in that area. The previous city council did. It wasn't even this city council. 
It had, I never got to vote on it, never once. How does anybody know how I would have voted on it? It was the previous city council, elected representatives that you put in office that decided they wanted to take that to LAFCO, and they did in accordance with the law, and that's what they're there for. And I appreciate LAFCO's job, and I think it's important. And I also think we've got a problem, and the problem has nothing to do with LAFCO. It has to do with the law never considered the fact that we would be a regional sewer plant. The law essentially thinks this is kind of, in my opinion, 20 years behind and thinks that, you know, if you have a town, you've got a sewer plant, and the sewer plant uh, just services the town. In fact, we service the region. We could have, we could write and ask for an exemption, I assume, to that portion of the LAFCO law. They may say no. Could we, could we ask for an exemption to the portion of the LAFCO law that says if we give someone our sewer plant, we don't have to annex them? Could we, could we write the state and ask them to exempt us from that? Yeah, you're talking about special legislation. That's the correct. The legislature would create a special exemption for sure, the for sewer a regional plant. sewer right. plant. Could we write? I mean, they make special exemption for Sam Ho San Jose, right? Right. Okay. Could we write and ask them to do that? You could ask them. Yeah. To the best of your knowledge, and I appreciate you coming here, to the best of your knowledge, have we ever done so? No, not for that issue. No. No. We, we've been complaining about it for 10 years or whatever, 12 years. No one's ever decided, oh, maybe we ought to write them a letter and say, this is not the way to do things. We could do that. They, the worst they could say is, I'm sorry, No. The answer is no. We'd be stuck where we are. So I think you do an enormous uh, uh, important job, and I think the fact that you showed a map where the county is developing urban around us, and as you said, your words, not mine, if you don't develop it, they're developing it, right? Mm -hmm. The good residents of Hollister have reason to complain when you wake up one morning and find out there's a county urban uh, development right outside but we didn't do it okay all those cars coming out of Santana Ranch have nothing to do with us we did not do it the reason we give them sewer plant is for the same reason I live in Hollister and I'm on the waste I'm on the water uh, from Sunny Slope it's because that's the way we operate around here cooperatively it has nothing to do with whether we think they ought to build there or not build there. We don't have that authority. We are a regional plant. It's in our plans. So I thank you for your time, and I really, really appreciate you coming here today, and I really, really appreciate you saying that everyone votes their conscience and that you can't force us to change the use of the land at all. Thank you very much. For your time. Thank you. Uh, one, just one okay. clarification. Just to make clear, Vice Mayor, I actually was not talking about you. I was actually Thank talking you. about the actual lobbyists that are out oh. there right now trying to do that. It wasn't about you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Councilor I, I just close with Mr. Nicholson. I, I wanted to thank you for your comprehensive reports. I also read the one you did for the Sunny Slope County Water District extending their boundary, and as well as the last one for um, Chapel Road. Uh, very comprehensive reporting. Uh, gave me a brush up on LAFCO. Huh. I worked for LAFCO 10 years in the county, many, a couple of few decades. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you for all your efforts, and uh, I thought that you wrote a very well, uh, those staff reports were very well done. No, thank you very and much. And thank you for coming this evening. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? Do we have any speaker cards? Elia Salinas. <laughs> have a safe ride home. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Nicholson. Thank you, Mayor and um, Council Members. My name is Elia Salinas, and I am not a lobbyist for any development whatsoever, and I have the same questions that also that were raised, and I found out that I was incorrect because I've been thinking about this for quite some time, actually, for more than, more than two years, that uh, City Council comes up here and they vote yes or they vote no, and then the LAFCO representative of the Council goes and poses and uh, votes against whatever was voted for the councilman and members. So I was I was incorrect, and it was an, an attorney that clarified that for me. So I have not heard of any lobbyists out there that represent developers that have been trying to do anything other than if anybody has anybody to anything any questions or in, going out there. Um, I think they they do ask the mayor directly. 
and uh, nobody has any issues coming up directly to the mayor and discussing this with him. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sweetheart. All right, we're going to go ahead and move to item B. Are we done? Are we done with that? Yeah, we're all done. With item. Um, Good evening, successor agency. This is a resolution that would authorize the initiation of proceedings to refund or refinance a 2009 redevelopment agency bond and to direct staff to begin putting together a team of legal and fiscal experts for the process. The underwriters for our most of our redevelopment agency bonds, Stiefel, have met with the city manager and our finance director and indicated that because of current interest rates, that there could is potential for annual savings of $180,000. That wouldn't go directly to the city. It would be shared amongst the taxing entities. And we say the taxing entities, that means those taxing local taxing agencies that are in the boundary of what else was our redevelopment agency project area. It's primarily schools, the hospital district, and the San Rio County Water District in San Rio County. The, uh, there's a lot of jumping through a lot of hoops to go through this process because when redevelopment agencies were dissolved, the authority of the successor agency was limited to paying down our bonds and a few activities but there's oversight for a lot of the things we do, so we would need to take get permission from the oversight board, which is there's local representatives on that board of taxing entities, if and then that would we'd have a forward that to the Department of Finance. But we'd need to put together a fiscal team with a fiscal consultant, a, a legal consultant, and the law stipulates there be a financial advisor. They, there needs to be documentation that we would be able to, uh, there would be savings like this with the payments would be less and also that we would still be able to pay off our bonds. Uh, finally, once the draft bond documents are prepared, we need to forward them to you, the successor agency, the oversight board and the Department of Finance before and also we'd have to submit a subordination request to San Diego County and I believe they have if I remember correctly, it's 45 days to respond to that. So this resolution would allow us to go to the oversight board to uh, initiate this process and start putting together the team of experts for the refunding. Is there any questions? Yeah, I do have a question. <clears throat> a few years back we did this, uh, 2012, 2013 when we worked on it to refinance the bonds. Well, I didn't see the dollars amount. The dollar amount with the it? with the prior one, we uh, it's been about one hundred forty five thousand dollars per year savings. We were saving, yeah, saving so on that. And how much of that did it cover? Okay. That's it, why I'm kind of wondering. I thought we got the majority of the, that bond at that time. So I'm curious on how much we refinanced at the time at the lower interest rate to get that savings. I think it was refinancing for lower interest. Yeah, the, I know, the, the debt remained the same. The, the, yeah, how much of that debt did it cover at that time? So I'm wondering what what rate are we talking about here? Is this redoing that also? So this is a lower rate than we got that, at that point. I think that was we got down to about three something. I don't, so what are we talking about here? And you want to, and, and I think the other thing is, is that they may be looking at as doing a, a uh, also a different kind of refinancing, going the more traditional through right through the bank um, process rather than um, going the municipal bond route. So it, 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 all that stuff, we'll, we'll probably we'll be able to tell you exactly um, before. Obviously, we get to the point where we're actually getting approvals for things. We can come back to the council and give you an update as to what the different options are as we move forward. And, and we have to have it all done by October. Yeah, so we have a call in October. Right. Um, so it's got to, it will move pretty quickly, but I'll be more than happy to give you those numbers. Yeah, it's um, just going to be very important. I remember when we went through it, we spent a lot of time with the different <coughs> consultants looking for the best way to do this. And as yeah. you point out, one of the 
ideas was a traditional. But if we can get those numbers from the past, what we did, what we're looking to do this time, timelines and so on. So it would be helpful for, I think, the entire council. And uh, obviously we're going to be saving money through making these kind of decisions. It's a good move in. Yeah, on one, of, part. one of the advantages, if I can, um, Go ahead. and if I say something wrong, Brett, will you let me know? Okay. Um, one of the advantages of, of maybe going a traditional route is uh, bond holders require the city to have at least one year's payment in reserve, right? When we go into a, a conventional finance, and we can take that one-year reserve and pay down debt, uh, which is pretty substantial. So you're ultimately you're not necessarily borrowing as much money up front as you would if you went the old law. So um, and with that that savings and, and a probably a like interest rate or lower interest rate will will allow us to see that savings. Well, I, I, exactly. But I, what I'm looking for is if we knew in the previous package that we did, we were saving $140,000, $150,000 a year. Are we saying it's an additional one hundred and eighty dollars above that? Yes. Or is it now would be one hundred and eighty? dollars Because this is the 2009 bond, it would be this the same. This is a different bond. $180,000 okay. for that bond. So we funded we can, a 2003 <laughs> tax allocation okay. bond in 2004. We took care of another one. That's why if we could be clear on it so we can all see the numbers. Also, too, a lot of these bonds, the later dates, have the higher interest rates. Right. Mm -hmm. Now you're getting those dates to um, a shorter period, so you're able to get those rates much lower, which creates savings also. Mm -hmm. So we just bring all the information. And it's obvious, again, it's a great idea and always important to be looking at ways to save, save dollars. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Is there any other questions from council? <clears throat> Do we have any speaker cards? No, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the update. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Mary. It, there's a resolution. Oh, is there a resolution? <laughs> yes. just... So we can move Mr. Forward. Mayor, I'd like to move a resolution 2019-02 uh, SA, a resolution of successor agency for the redevelopment agency, City of Hollister, requesting oversight board of successor agency to the redevelopment agency, RDA of City of Hollister, to direct initiation proceedings for refunding, a great word, of the outstanding 2009 tax allocation bond of the RDA for the associated fiscal and legal services. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Larry. <clears throat> okay, public input. This is the time for anyone in the audience to speak on any item not on the agenda and within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. Speaker cards are available in the lobby and are to be completed and given to the city clerk before speaking. When the city clerk calls your name, please come to the podium, state your name and city for the record, and speak to the city council. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes with a maximum of 30 minutes per subject. Please note that state law prohibits the city council from discussing or taking action on any item not on the agenda. Do we have any speaker cards? Yes, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> The first is a written correspondence from Joseph Thompson that we received via mail. <coughs> and my first speaker is Kevin Barcelos. Hello, I'm Kevin Barcelos from Hollister. Uh, on behalf of the SNP bus volunteer team, I wanted to thank members of the council, staff at the shelter, Oliveira and Chief Westrick uh, for coming down to the privately funded SNP bus event the weekend before last. Uh, they saw firsthand the professionalism of the SNP bus staff and the enthusiasm of the volunteers that make uh, these events so successful. Rumor has it that uh, Bill even got to observe a procedure on the bus. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Which even someone like me, who is inv as involved in the subject as I am, uh, don't have this time before. <laughs> oh. So congratulations, Bill, for earning your spay, neuter, merit badge. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, the, the, the event was a total success. Um, we processed 61 dogs and 15 domestic cats, along with 45 ferals on the bus, and then another 26 ferals outside of the bus via Heading Home Rescue. Uh, so that was a total of 147 animals, just a, a, a tremendous number. Um, Sunday was crazy. It was like we had the rain and the hail and the wind and the cold, and we, we had 41 people signed up, zero no-shows. Just shows like the demand and the appreciation that community has for this, for access to this service. Um, for the first time at this event, we did some proactive sign-up. So we actually walked some neighborhoods 
where we knew that we, there were a quite, a, quite a population of unfixed animals, and we were able to sign up 25 uh, dogs and cats from, those, from, those, uh, 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 from that community, and again, zero no-shows. And we think we're going to be able to expand this in other events, and if we can use like statistics from the shelter, we can really target this uh, this activity to to to, to uh, get out in front of the problems in these neighborhoods where those uh, animals are roaming. Um, today, uh, our, our team uh, spoke at the Board of Supervisors meeting, and uh, there were six of us. And our ask was really simple: we want them to to match the funding uh, from the city uh, uh, at at the county level. Um, supervisors were engaged, so we're cautious, cautiously optimistic. And at the direction of of the board, um, Ray Espinosa agreed to add a, an agenda item to the next Board of Supervisors meeting to consider the funding for that service. And we're really excited about that. Um, frankly, if we can double the funding, we can you know, go from every other month to every month and, and open up lots of other kind of avenues of, of um, you know, advancement in the, in, the, in the way we deal with these, uh, with, deal with these animals. <laughs> Things like uh, expanding the, you know, the spay-neuter regulation from just chihuahuas and pit bulls to all breeds because now we have the services to be able to provide those, uh, uh, those processes. Um, so, you know, just uh, in conclusion, I want to thank the council again. The community is very excited to get this program rolling, um, and I look forward to continuing to update the, the council on the progress going forward. Thank you, thank you very much. Courtney Evans. <clears throat> Hello, good evening. My name is Courtney Evans. I live here in Hollister and I own a business on 6th Street. Um, I am coming up to thank the mayor for posting the Code of Ethics on Facebook and I recommend that we develop an administrative practices and process which promotes ethical values and integrity. Our ethics, integrity, and accountability for those things um, are something, as a Hollister native, that I hold very dear, how we, um, how we support our community. Um, in, I believe that elected officials should give reasons for their official decisions. I believe in the freedom of information law, and I believe that we should have a process to deal positively with corruption and unethical practices. I believe we should have ethical audits, and most country today have increasing expectations from ordinary citizens, business leaders, and civil society that the government will establish and deliver high standards of ethics and integrity in civil service agencies and our government. Um, this form and these words um, are insufficient. And if we fail as a community to implement and enforce, we, have, we as a community will have no control in corruption that will hinder our ability to grow a positive community. So um, I encourage you to look up Transparency International by Howard Witten, and we adopt practices of holding our elected officials accountable for their actions. Thank you. Indeed. I have no more speakers, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Wow. Salvador Mora. Good evening, Good evening Mr. Mayor, City Councilman. Um, so some of what I'm going to say is, you know, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Evans mentioned uh, as well. I wanted to respond. And speak on about how our elected officials act on social media. Uh, the only social media I'm a part of is Facebook, mostly just reading comments. Uh, you know, I think if 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 an elected official is going to make allegations of corruption on social media, you should have some proof. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I asked you a question to provide proof that uh, on your allegation that our elected officials are taking money from developers. You failed to answer my questions. I've answered yours. Uh, you respectfully did not answer mine. Uh, it's very frustrating. Over the past seven years I've lived here, actually eight, uh, especially during the campaign, 
you know, um, seeing false information. Um, you know, it's very easy to make an allegation, but I've never seen you provide proof. It's very disturbing that our leaders are acting this way. Um, I would love to see some proof. You've yet to provide any. And, and I'm not saying that uh, you're right or wrong. I'm saying if you make an allegation as an elected official, please provide some proof. I would love to see it. If you have it, I like to see it so that way I can say, yes, you know what, you're absolutely correct. But just to make an allegation without proof, I think that's irresponsible. And uh, trying to make individuals look bad in the public court of opinion when it's just not true. If it is, again, please provide your, your, your uh, constituents that proof. And, uh, and you can respond after. You know, uh, Mr. Richmond, uh, you know, I, I definitely appreciate all the information that you post and have given out over the years. I've gone back and read a lot of really insightful information. Uh, the only issue I have is it's very disturbing reading some of your comments, uh, how you respond to the constituents. Uh, you give good information, but then you're very uh, condescending and arrogant and outright rude towards individuals. You know, these are your constituents, whether they voted for you or not, whether they're in your district or not. Not everybody understands the legal terminology. You should have some patience. And instead of criticizing and making fun of people, especially as a man that's been around as long as you have, you should show some, some respect to the community members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? I have no more speakers, Mr. Right. Mayor. We're going to move to item D, city manager's report. Thank you. Um, and I, and um, Chief Wester can correct me again if I'm wrong. Just real quick, kind of um, elaborating on what uh, Kevin was saying earlier about SNP buses. I believe we're going to have a two-day event, March 2nd and March 3rd. Um, the location still is kind of up in the air, um, but that is the money that uh, the council allocated as, as part of my budget. Um, and then Chief Westbrook will be coming back uh, with an additional resolution here very, very shortly to do some other things. So I just wanted to um, kind of uh, ride Kevin's coattails on that. Um, and I know for um, uh, Salvador, it, it is a little bit frustrating to not have the council be able to uh, respond to your questions during the public comment part, but that's just the way it is. So I just I want to make sure I usually do that just so that people know that they're not ignoring you. They're just they're just not allowed to communicate back. So, all right, thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move to item E one. Who's handling that one? Christine, do you want to do the third meeting one, or do you want me to do it? Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm always so busy with your question. Right <laughs> um, at the city council meeting, um, let's see. Give me just one second. I'm sorry. Special meeting. At the special meeting of January 14th, the City Council directed staff to introduce an ordinance amending the Hollister Municipal Code to change the number of regular City Council meetings from two to three per month. Um, I have provided a copy of an amended uh, ordinance and um, I'm seeking direction from um, Council to approve read by title only, waive full reading, and introduce an ordinance amending the Municipal Code Chapter 2, Section 2.04.010 meetings, changing from two regular meetings a month to three to be held on the first, third, and fourth Mondays of each month. Is there any questions or comments, Council? Uh, Vice Mayor Richmond. Thank you. Um, first, um, this was originally something I brought to the Council. I, I want to take a minute before we go forward to thank the staff. I know this is a heavy burden on the staff, but I'm hoping that if we get on a regular three-meeting agenda, we can get out of here earlier and not, not 12.30 or half an hour, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning so many times. That's really important. There's a lot of work to do. Um, 
the staff has been extraordinarily uh, helpful and extraordinarily patient with me and the re I think the rest of the City Council and everybody gets a, a, a good service and uh, so that's my intention it is not just to, just to have everybody come here uh, at some point in time if we ever get caught up I think um, two meetings may be adequate but somehow or another I, it is my opinion that last year we got quite bogged down and even though I wasn't a member of the council I came to a lot of meetings and I stayed late 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 and as it gets late people start getting itchy and a lot of people leave and they don't they don't hear important stuff so that is my intention and that's why I uh, brought this to the council and uh, after um, I, I intend to make the motion after everybody gets to speak thank you the question I had have we done a cost analysis on this I have not I would say you know, the issue I had with it was we're adding another meeting which means quite a bit of hours has to be put in to make these meetings happen and then we have to have staff here that night to make sure we can have the meeting but well, I would guess it's going to cost anywhere between three to five thousand dollars for an extra meeting but time we get staff time and everything else so I I want to those, know those numbers I think a better strategy as I pointed out was like if we have to put additional items each meeting one item we could achieve the same thing without incurring an additional fifty to seventy five thousand dollars in cost to have an extra meeting which would I believe set you guys back also as far as staff because you're always scrambling to organize a meeting I just don't think it's the wisest choice to be doing this if there's something critically important we can always have a special meeting to handle it but I, I just think it's better to add an item that we're concerned about to each meeting and we'll still get at a reasonable time I'm impressed I, I see some board members here board of supervisors these guys have eight-hour meetings I believe um, most of the time I think we could an alternate hours. to amending the ordinance could be to um, maybe do a resolution that says maybe for the next six months we add an additional special meeting on that fourth Monday of the month which is something we could do also just so that we have a date set or something to that nature or as the mayor said we can always just hold a special meeting whenever there's something hot brewing or something that we need to have done so the choice is of course yours okay. is there any uh, Councilor yes. Lenore thank you uh, there, there probably is some day staff they're they're already working so I don't know where the cost increase is your executive management when they attend a city council meeting are not getting anything above what they're already getting on their salary they don't get comp time they don't get overtime so it's not an extra cost for executive management to be here correct Bill yeah I was just, I was just looking around the room I don't know if we have any hourly employees yeah usually there's not maybe maybe Mary, uh, Mary? no no so they're they're not being paid extra as far as staff they're they're on the job eight to five Monday through Friday. <laughs> More I do for a lot of years. Yeah, or we're definitely paying our city attorney <laughs> to come. Okay, in. you're correct there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's cost. <laughs> there's cost. There's a cost there. You're correct. Absolutely. Is that it, Ms. Lenore? <laughs> yes. Thank you, okay. uh, Vice Mayor Richmond. Um, I don't want to beat beat a dead horse. My concern with special meetings are if the public's not aware. Uh, when there's a special meeting the notice goes down to 24 hours I believe is that correct so there's only 24 hours notice to the public and the second issue with special meeting is uh, there is no public input for items not on the agenda so basically you don't get another chance to speak to the council three times a, a month instead of two and I understand it's difficult and I'd be willing to to make this um, I, I, I'd be willing to make this a date certain. Uh, uh, I, w I would be willing to change uh, if I can get a consensus from the city uh, city council. I'd be willing to to make this rather than a permanent change, a temporary change for six months, and try it for six months and see what happens. 
My concern, the reason I did it originally is I was sworn in in December. We were only going to have one meeting in December. There was, uh, originally, we were only going to have one meeting in January. We don't have any meetings in July at all. Actually, we haven't decided that for this year yet. Oh, we haven't? We well, have that not. was basically our, thank you. I appreciate your input. But it, it had been our regular agenda not to have any meetings in July at all, which meant that every month that went by was 5%, almost four, four, over 4.5% four of my term, okay? So two, if two months go by and something doesn't get done, that's 10% of the term. It goes by really, really fast. And I just wanted to make sure that we get through agenda items because if they're not on the agenda, they're, the, although people may be working on them in the back, we can't get them moved. I think we've moved some extraordinarily good items, and they, they are moving along. So I, uh, in, in a hopes of um, being um, more cooperative, I would, um, I would like to um, offer to amend that um, request by, by moving that we uh, change uh, this to a six-month period and uh, read by title only, waive full reading, and introduce ordinance amending the municipal code, section uh, 2.04.010 meetings, changing from two regular meetings a month to three to be held on the first, third, and fourth Mondays of each month for the next six months. Uh, also subject to the council taking a what do you, would you call it, a legislative vacation in July? Legislative if, if, recess. So if, far, oh, um, the recess. council, um, I believe in 2017 or 2018, um, requested that the first meeting in January from here on be um, um, canceled so that we only have the one meeting in January. But they decided that the July legislative recess would be decided each year. Okay. Well, that that would be my that I would make that motion. Thank and you. There, there's a motion. Do we, wait, do we have any speakers? Oh, parts? sorry. We have no speakers, Mr. Mayor. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 No. So we had. Point of clarification: Are we going to? Can we vote on that with the amendment that he that's, just said? That's with the amendment. Six months. Got it. Okay, so it's four one. So that would be changed from an ordinance then to a resolution. So I would need to come back with that um, on the March fourth. That's 4th. fine. We'll okay. Just, so we, get we couldn't even vote on this item. You're saying oh. it was changed kind to of, a resolution. Yeah, it was changed to a resolution. Okay, so so it satisfies me. Okay. Gina. Okay. So no action was taken. Tonight. No action was taken tonight, um, and I will. Um, um, come back with the resolution for Thank six you. months. Thank so. you for Just for clarification, that. you yes. do have special meetings already scheduled. I saw, I saw I them on the yes. schedule. Thank you yes. for the public. That's mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item F1. Uh -oh. <clears throat> there. Wait, before we do that, do we have any uh, high school students here tonight? One or two. Yeah. One there. You want to... Uh, You've been sitting here patiently. Usually we, we uh, take a break at 7.30. If we can all take a five-minute break so we can get him signed out. Unless you want to hang Maybe around to the whole meeting. <laughs> I don't think But I haven't met stay. a student yet that's willing to do that. <laughs> so if it's all right, the council will take a, a five-minute break. Take him out. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Council member, is it? Is it this? I appreciate it. I, I like the resolution. I didn't catch that. That's fine. I'm satisfied. He's the mayor. So why? He's the mayor. He yes. Come on. Let me do why. Yeah, I didn't catch the resolution. Neither did I. That makes two of us. Chairman, how's it going? Phil, how was your yeah. son's uh, practice? I see he's a little, he's a little sore when he walked in. <laughs> Mm. What kind of practice? Soccer. Oh, my son was played soccer, my older one. All kinds. Oh, that's all kinds. <laughs> What's happening?
Good evening. Christine, can I get the, um, the PowerPoint, please? Good evening, everyone. Um, the item before tonight um, is for the approval of a cannabis use permit for a higher level of care to operate a medical cannabis dispensary. At its regular City Council meeting of November 5th of 2018, the City Council directed staff to work with higher level of care for the permitting process of the second and last cannabis uh, medical dispensary and bring it back for the final approval. Um, thus, uh, staff has worked with the applicant, uh, has ensured they submit all of their application paperwork and that they meet all the rules and regulations prior to this step tonight. Um, the <clears throat> Excuse me. As part of the application review, the application was brought to the Cannabis Review Committee as well, and um, then it was uh, obviously brought uh, before the City Council. And just as a little bit of information, uh, background, the, um, the, uh, the location is at 1802 Shelton Drive, as shown above. This uh, facility has come before the City Council a few times for a few um, <coughs> cannabis use permits, including manufacturing and cultivation, as well as distribution. And then this last one is for the dispensary. This is just a um, little bit of imp uh, information of the way the, the building is um, set up. Again, it's at 1802 Shelton Drive. It, the building is roughly about uh, 76,000 square feet in total. It's an existing building, and the dispensary would occupy uh, at least uh, 2,000 square feet of the entire section, and it's kind of like the, the portion, it's not really visible, but it's, there's a, like a yellow circle around it, and that's where the dispensary would be located, it's towards the front of the building that fronts uh, Shelton. I don't know if we can zoom, I don't think so, but I. Try to use a different color. The hours of operation as it is now, according to the ordinance, is seven to nine, seven days a week. And um, the applicant um, assumes that there would, they would be um, beginning operations, maybe um, taking eight, at least 20 patients a day. Did I mess you up now? No, you're, you're fine. Yeah, thank you. With, with that, staff recommends the City Council adopt a resolution approving a cannabis use permit and development agreement for a higher level of care to operate a medical cannabis dispensary at 1802 Shelton Drive. Are there any questions? Okay. Any questions from Council? Uh, Vice Mayor Richard? Uh, just curious, you said 20 patients a day. Did they, uh, have they publicly released, only if it's publicly released, an estimate of when they would start? Um, they, it is my understanding that the applicant is ready to begin operations this spring, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any speaker cards? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, is there a motion? I move that we approve, we adopt resolution 2019-34, approving a cannabis use permit and a development agreement for a high, higher level of care at 1802 Shelton Drive. Okay, there's a motion, is there a second? Second. second. I think uh, Councilmember Spencer beat you out there. Sure. So first <laughs> and a second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye, motion carries, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Okay, we're gonna move to item G1 reports from the city council members regarding their committees. Hey. Council member Lenore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> committees, not comments. <laughs> That's Lex. Okay. Um, uh, since our last meeting, uh, I did attend a meeting with the Pinnacle Strategy regarding park fee credits. As well, I met with the HDA promotion, promotion uh, committee at their office. Uh, I also um, attended the San Benito County Business Council luncheon uh, where development was the top subject. Uh, that was on February 7th. I met with uh, Mr. Bob Kane regarding some property on San Benito Street. I attended uh, an HDA 
uh, meeting on the 12th at 8 a.m., early meetings. Then Wednesday, February 13th, I attended an AMBAG meeting, and I, I enjoyed it. It's quite a group of folks. I recognized some folks from the League of California cities, and I said hi to some of them. Um, also, I wanted to just let you know that MBEG really does us some good. That's an association of, of Monterey Bay Area Governments, MBEG, of which we are part of. Um, <clears throat> one of the things uh, that they've done is they've done a lot of energy efficiency projects uh, for us. They've actually saved us 1,340,198 kilowatts for a monetary uh, savings of 178,000. 989 uh, in, in avoided energy costs. They have also, um, AMBAG Energy Watch also supports the completion of a community-wide GSG, thus the greenhouse gas emissions in Hollister. We've decreased our greenhouse gas emissions, how we said, greenhouse gas emissions by 15% from 2005 to 2015. So that's, that's very good. We're, we're on the right direction. Let's see, uh, a reduction in electricity and natural gas usage, as well as an increase in the amount of renewable energy, that's some smart planning, in the electricity mix uh, may have contributed to this decrease. Uh, decrease. And then finally, um, AMBAG has worked with the City of Hollister to obtain Beacon Awards. The Institute for Local Government recognizes cities and counties that have chosen to take a leading role in promoting sustainability and addressing climate change through the Beacon Awards. Okay, that's, that was the AMBAG. I have information if anybody would like to see. A lot of it was LED lighting. They did a really good job in the Margaret Mays gym, saved the school a considerable amount of money there. I do have a list. And then I also attended the Water Resource Agency out there on Mansfield Road. Very, very much enjoyed that commission. Um, uh, Sonny Flores is the chairman there. I'm always happy to see him. Um, uh, but the most uh, one that stands out, of course, is Sean Novak. He runs your Water Resource Association. Uh, he's just a font of information, and I can't say enough good about the, about the information uh, that he puts out. So currently, they are having a video contest, uh, and he really engages the school youth. He's all about youth, because he said you can't reach them young enough to save water, so you really can teach them at a young age to be conscious of their, of their water consumption. So they have a, a video contest that it's going to contents as at midnight on March 4th. Uh, they're looking for um, uh, inspire others to save water by making a short newscast, newscast skit, animation, commercial, or even a music video. So this is something the Water Resources is doing. He also has a nice brochure of, of several of the programs that they have. They're, they're very much uh, dedicated for eliminating water softeners. Water softener is not good for our wastewater treatment plant. And the water with, with our two water uh, uh, plants now that we have cleaning the water for, uh, better has made it more soft. So you don't need those water conditioners, those water softeners. And then also the toilet program has been a great success. And they continue on with, with the program. So I encourage everybody to um, be conscious of your water usage. And then I wanted to ask the mayor, would you like me to invite Mr. Novak in, in the near future yeah, he, to give a report? Yeah, he comes out annually. That'd be great. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. And I believe... Um, that's all I have for committees. Um, and, of course, I attended the Chamber of Commerce dinner that was Saturday night, and it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, that's not a committee. <laughs> oh, I, darn it, I was good till then. You oh, were, well, whatever. You were doing good. You were doing well. <laughs> Councilmember Spencer. <laughs> okay, well, none of my committees meet. I have a meeting tomorrow in Monterey um, for the Monterey Air Resource Um I did meet with um, the HDA with uh, Councilwoman um, Lenore, and I also went to her meeting on the water resource. Um, that's right. Yeah, I was yeah. there. Um, yes, that's about all I've done. <laughs> okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Richard. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I had three committee meetings on which I served. One was the Affluent uh, committee at the waste at the um, domestic wastewater plant, and I was at that meeting, and so were you, and so was the city manager, and Mr. Chambliss, and several other people. And this is about coming up with a better way 
to treat the sludge and uh, get rid of the sludge that uh, is part of the current process of uh, cleaning the wastewater. I also took a tour of the plant that the very same day, a, a very long tour, and I uh, was very impressed with what it looked like and how it operated. And uh, I appreciate uh, that tour from our, both our, our employees and, and Veolia. Uh, the second uh, item I attended was the, uh, as the, as the ad hoc representative or the representative of the, of the uh, new library and uh, uh, a cu new community library and resource center, uh, which had a meeting at the library and um, uh, this was a very interesting meeting. Uh, as always, they provided a lot of information concerning the current library and its um, um, operations and uh, talked about their plans for a new library. And uh, I have to say that um, we, we don't have the library we deserve. That's my personal opinion. Uh, we need a... We, we, we need a better library. The, they've done extraordinarily good with the limited facility they have, but that facility is from the 1960s, and it 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 looks it. Okay, so that's my opinion. And then the uh, this afternoon, I I was sat in as the ad hoc representative on the uh, economic development uh, corporation uh, meeting, and uh, was interested uh, to hear their point of view on. Uh, economic development and what they can do for uh, Hollister and and San Benito County. That's my report. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sendis. <clears throat> yes, thank you. As Mr. Barcellus was here earlier and he spoke about the SNP bus, um, I was fortunate to go down there. I spent about a good hour or so at the facility. Um, I wasn't as brave as our city manager to go watch a procedure. <laughs> I looked at the um, I don't know if I would have been able to do that. But if anything, it was very rewarding, I would say, to see that we finally have the service here for our community and to watch the the citizens come and pick up their animals. And they were so excited. They they were saying that they got a puppy of litters and they had them all scheduled for the previous next or the next days and whatnot. So it was very rewarding. I was happy to hear that um, there was some council people out there. I know council member Spencer was out there. And... Um, What's that? I went. Oh, good. Yeah, I just missed you. Good, good, yeah. good, good. And then I heard um, that there was lots of staff out there, too, and I even seen some of our staff out there. So that was pretty cool. I um, got to sit down and meet with the General Plan Advisory. Uh, maybe the mayor can touch more on that. But essentially, we said we got an update about the uh, General Plan, putting out the RFP. We spoke a little bit about that getting a consultant to get that going. Um, I asked planning for a flow chart of, uh, like, of the developments to see where we're at with it. I know in one of the previous agenda packets, they gave us a flow chart of how to annex. So I just said it'd be helpful for us to have that as far as like planning goes. Carol, um, Council Member Lenore, I'm sure you won't need one, but. <laughs> I have a lot of information that they Wonderful. gave me right before I left the planning commission, but staff can give it to you. It yeah, shows you yeah. all of the current everything. Yeah, if you want to pass I it on too. Sure. That'd be you bet. Good. Um, what else? Oh, we got a brief update on the growth management plan at that meeting as well. That's it for my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, for my report, I had my intergovernmental meeting. We had a presentation from the high school. And again, if you have not seen the high school lately, go take a tour. It's really something special that's going on over there. The new pool, you can see it from the road now. They're moving along there. The sports fields, you see the bleachers going up now. And the technology or the robotic centers being built currently. So the superintendent there is very open to set up tours. Please contact him. Great things going on. We also decided we're going to change the meeting date or the time from 10 in the morning to 4 on the first Thursday of each month. And San Juan Batista is still trying to appoint one member. As far as the growth committee, as uh, Council Member Sanders was pointing out, we had a conversation about moving forward on the management plan or the growth plan, general plan. And also, one thing that is popping up is the issue with the affordable housing that we need to implement to make it, to create some of the housing here for our local residents. So we'll be looking into that pretty soon, along with the general plan. And that is all I have. So we're going to go to item two. G2, 
informational reports. Councilmember Lenar. Well, because I did it wrong again, so <laughs> I'll just be you, quiet. You halfway I, did it this time, right? So you're it, good. I, I don't know why. I you got know what? A, I, I think that, I'll tell stuff. you what. I think personally, they should just be combining the one. Yeah. So. You know what? We'll though, work on I, that. I know I can do it, but I have no more to say. Thank okay, you so no much. Problem. You don't want to say maybe who was man and woman of the year, Carol? What's that again? You want to say who was man or woman of the year? The man or woman? Oh, uh, you mean for the Chamber of Commerce? Uh, it was Robert Quaid was the man of the year, and Jamie Stewart I was, was the woman of the year. I'm, I'm very, very honored. Uh, the mayor and the vice mayor weren't available, so they came on down to me, and I really enjoyed representing the city of Hollister, and I was proud to represent the city. And uh, it was a very good event. Uh, uh, the Leal Vineyards did a wonderful job, but the most important thing is Michelle Leonard from the Chamber of Commerce did a beautiful job, and along with all the help, or, help that she had. So uh, thank you for allowing me to represent the city on that Chamber of Commerce dinner. Great. Councilmember Spencer. Yes. Okay. So I've prepared something that I want to talk about. There's been a lot of talk on social media pertaining to events that happened on the February 4th City Council meeting. Statements have been made that I voted for selling parking to developers. This is far from the truth. Here is what I voted for. One, place time limits on hours of two loading zone parking spaces on San Benito Street to the hours of 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. Allow adjustments to the location of trash enclosures. And three, replace the requirements for a lot line adjustment and street vacation with the requirement for a parcel map that will merge the underlying parcels into one lot. With that said, I would also like to say, I will not, and I repeat, I will not answer anybody on social media. If you want to know why I voted a certain way, or you want to actually know the truth of what is going on, please feel free to call me. My number is 831-673-3367, or you can email me at coh.district3 at hollister.ca.gov. I will meet with you in person, one-on-one, -on -one, and we can talk about the issues. It saddens me that, the, that there are those that knowingly put information out on social media that they know is false or half-truths, just to stir up controversy. I'm appalled at the bullying, threats, and name-calling. This has to stop on both sides. As a community, we need to set an example for our children that we will not tolerate bullying, but how can we when we are the bullies? This council is bound by ethics, but I see I am seeing no ethical behavior coming from some, and this too needs to stop. I have read posts from community members that are tired of all the fighting within, and I am with you on that. Um, it is time for us to grow up and tackle the problems of our community and quit dwelling on issues that have already been decided. The behavior of late is tearing our community apart, and with such uncertainty in our country, it is imperative that our community stands together. We will not see eye to eye on everything, but we must respect and support each other. It has been said to me that this council is a joke, and this that hurts. I am very honored that I was elected to this position. I take my duties very seriously. I may not have been born here, but my family has deep-seated roots in this community. Some go back as far as the late 1800s. So I do very deeply, I do care very deeply about this community and about the people that call Hollister in San Benito County their home. Thank you. I'm done. That's it. Thank you. I'd like to start my, uh, my report by saying ditto to uh, council members. Spencer's report. Um, in addition to that, I did go see the uh, business. I did attend the business council meeting. Uh, I also attended uh, the excellent uh, strategic planning uh, session that was held uh, by the San Benito County Board of Supervisors, and I thank them for inviting the city members. I was not the only city member there. There were others. And I thank them for inviting the city members there for a very interesting and informative session on day one. And I was only there for a partial session on day two, but that portion I saw was also excellent, and I appreciate it. 
In addition to that, I would like to say that I am getting many, many communications concerning serious traffic violations. These are not about people just grousing. Time and again, they say the same thing. People are running stop signs, and they're running stop signs regularly on, on very busy, busy streets, and we are going to have an enormous tragedy. I know the police department put out a special, um, a special task force to try and cut down on the speeding around the schools, and I believe uh, even uh, even doing what they can uh, will will help. But this running of stop signs, uh, this has to stop. And I hope that um, I think well, I think in the future we're going to have to do something about it. Whether we whether we go to um, traffic cameras because maybe they're uh, they're affordable uh, or something. People running stop signs um, in areas where children play. People running stop signs at intersections where there's high speed uh, traffic coming the other way. You're just asking for for basically a death penalty because you somebody's going to wind up dead so i hope uh, i hope we can do something about it i've passed the specific information on to the um, uh, to the engineering department to look at what we can do to engineer it better uh, and i discussed it uh, with um, um, uh, the police department this afternoon and i'm going to keep doing so until we can figure out a way to keep people from doing that. Uh, if you get a ticket, and it is really an expensive ticket for running a stop sign, uh, you, I, hope, I hope it hurts when you pay for it because I want that, that to stop. Thank you very much. Okay, Council Member Sendis. <coughs> Thank you. I attended uh, the Parks and Recreation meeting at the Firehouse One regarding the, I think it was a Leatherback property. Mm -hmm. I was invited to go to, it's called a, the Niner Empire for San Benito County chapter. It's a, um, like a local fan group, I would say, um, for the 49ers, and then they do a lot of charity work. They specifically asked me to go to give me an update on their involvement with the Rayleigh for Life. Uh, they do a lot of other charitable events, and so I'll be joining them on that. And then they were also interested in possibly coaching for the 49er Flag Football League we got coming up, so I sent that over to Tina Garza. Um, I went to the murder mystery dinner that the Inspired Dance Academy put on here locally at Payne's. It was really cool. It was all children, and I saw some of my friends there. And um, I would invite you to also support the arts whenever we can, especially the local arts. And I'm surprised nobody talked about this. Uh, it's at the bottom of my list, too. Uh, most of us attended the San Benito County Chamber of Commerce Strategic Planning event they had. Um, we talked about it at the last council meeting. I took a couple of days off work. I went both days from beginning to end. I learned a lot. It was very insightful to see what uh, that we're tackling some of the same issues, obviously, and that there was a lot of optimism uh, from the counts, from the supervisors and from ourselves as far as us forging together ahead. So excited for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank uh, Ms. Felkins from Mays Middle School, eighth grade, for inviting me out to speak to her students. The, uh, our students, our community, always have a lot of great questions, and it's, I'm always amazed at how much they, they know about our, our community. And I'm hoping some of the other teachers out there uh, invite me out. I'd be happy to come speak to your, your students also. Uh, I, a good friend of ours, uh, former council member Robbie Scatini, is in the hospital in San Jose right now. He was in intensive care for several weeks. I went to go visit him uh, a couple days ago. Um, Supervisor Dela Cruz and I drove out to go visit him. He was doing a, lot, a little better. And all of you that are friends out there, if you can, you know, send him a card or send him well wishes. He's at San Jose Regional, and um, very good man. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, it was hard to see him in the situation, but he's a fighter. And I'm sure he'll be back to our community soon, and I'm wishing him well. City Manager? <clears throat> um, with uh, On that same subject with uh, uh, Mr. Scatini, did he, he's been up there the whole time, right? 
Okay. He's been up there. He's not, yes. Okay. Yes, he's been up there for a while. Because <clears throat> I thought he, I thought he was. Um, I was hoping that he didn't go back. I thought that he was going to be released. And but there, yeah, there's, they're hoping to release him this week, but okay. there's there's issues still. So okay, thank you. Um, really, I only have uh, one thing to report. Uh, about 30 seconds, just on me. Um, about a month ago or so, I gave uh, the city council a verbal that I was going to be retiring in November. Um, I made that formal today with a written letter to the council members. So I just wanted to make that announcement that my last day with the city of Hollister will be November 15th. Um, I gave uh, that kind of a notice just so that um, the council had plenty of time to consider options for my successor, and that is it. So, thank you thank for you. everything. We're going to move to the city attorney. Nothing, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. City clerk. I have nothing to report. Chief. Yes, I have something. Uh, two weeks ago, I did attend this SNP bus event. Um, well, they're operating their uh, Spaniard clinic at Holster RV. It was. Um, I wanted to see the operation uh, running uh, during one of those events. To, uh, and, and I was. was very impressed with their professionalism and their efficiency of their operation. Um, I was most impressed with the uh, volunteers that were, were local that uh, um, actually volunteered all three days of the event. Our uh, supervisor, Kara Ells, also um, for the uh, animal control, so attended the event. She had similar thoughts as well. And she spoke to me um, later on about um, possibly uh, future events within our community, of course, together. It's my understanding that SNP bus organization has recently had an influx of volunteers and staff, and I left in renewed hope uh, when I went to the, the event that we can partner with the uh, SNP bus and, of course, our own Hollister Animal Care and Services uh, and provide services uh, at a reduced cost to our community on an ongoing basis. Unfortunately, I also received information that our animal control department is also, was also being unfairly criticized. There have been comparisons to another organization that is four times the staff and a budget of about $2 million. The people that work for my department, and in fact the entire city staff, are the heart and soul of this organization. They are the reason that we can get things done oftentimes with reduced staff, reduced money. And it's these people that are the most important assets of our departments and our city as a whole. I will defend them every time when they are unfairly criticized. From the short time she has been with us, Supervisor Ells has done a great job improving our shelter and the services we provide. Most people don't know that for a big portion of the time she has worked here, she has been the only person on call after many hours, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, for the entire city and county, It'd be a very difficult job to do. We have struggled to hire qualified personnel to fill the vacant positions, and she has done an amazing job considering the difficult work it is to operate a shelter and conduct field calls at the same time. I want to make it clear, I stand 100% behind her and the work she has done, and I'm very lucky to have someone of her experience and caliber in such an important position. I also thank her, Lieutenant Olson, Captain Reynoso, and the staff of the shelter for their continuing amazing work they do for the city and this community as well. In a few weeks, we will ask the city council to allow us to have an ongoing beneficial relationship with SNP, their amazing volunteers, our staff, that will be a great asset for our entire community. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to move to item G3. Ratify the appointments for a planning commission, Parks and Rec. Um, currently, we have Honor. You have. Um, A commissioner to appoint for the Planning Commission. And the only application we have received is the one. And I'm not sure if you're wanting to reappoint. Yes, I yes. will reappoint Seth, uh, Seth Munzer. <coughs> Seth. 
so council consensus yes on that yes okay and christine for and christine graziano graziano, graziano for, for parks and rec parks and rec okay and i think i'm done <laughs> I, um, I got Bowen, everybody in place. You have um, one commissioner to appoint to Parks and Rec, and I have received one um, application for a Mathia Anderson. Yes, I'd like to appoint her, please, okay. for District 2. And then, Mayor, you have one person to appoint, and I'm not sure, I don't know if Mike is here, if we have received any recommendations yet from the airport commission we did okay so the airport commission sorry on my report it just is it i have three so mark, mark. these two yeah so um the two commissioners for uh county for the airport that was recommended by the airport commission was Mark Starrett and Margaret Sonseri. There was another county position um, application for Dean Judd as well. So the two that they um, recommended was Mark and Margaret. If okay, I'll, I have one, correct? So I'll choose Mr. Starrett. And you have one in addition to these two. Yes, you have one in addition to these two. So you could either, your choices now could either be Dean or does, does his have to be in the city? Yes. Okay, so if yours has to be in the city, Right now, the only one we have is Jose Martinez, or we could wait and, and accept more applications. I, I appreciate Mr. Martinez being involved, so we can continue with him. Continue with him? Yes. Okay. So then I'm going to uh, mark it as uh, Mark Starrett, Margaret Sonseri, and Jose Martinez to the airport advisory, which would then... Oh, and then we have one youth committee um, appointment to make, and that's Alexander Johnson, and that would make a full commission and youth committee yes yes if i can get consensus that's all is i there need yes yes. Yes. yes we're all on awesome thank you so much thank you <laughs> okay so we're going to move on to item g5 the thank you mr mayor i believe um um Oh, it doesn't really matter. So we were going to uh, see about appointing a couple of members to an ad hoc committee to work with the county on a joint um, county parks and the Tell Center. So right, this is ad hoc. Yeah, I asked for. I'd like to appoint Council Member Resendez and myself to that committee. Thank you. I'm sorry, but that is, that is for the uh, joint parks and Tell. Thank you. And Tell Center. Okay, we'll move to item G6. Um, G6, I, I think I heard at the last meeting that we wanted to establish an ad hoc committee for the council norms, protocols, code of ethics. Um, if that's the direction that the council wants to go, if you, or you want to do something different, just let me know. I, I do have a question for the council on this because I, this is a big conversation last time. So uh, Vice Mayor Richmond has a comment. Yes, I, I asked that uh, be, that be agendized. So there was a big conversation last time. Uh, I did a lot of work uh, looking into it. Um, I can tell you what I believe I found. Yes, there was a code of ethics and a protocols and norm adopted in December of 2017. But if you didn't know where they were, you were going to have a hell of a time finding them. And I think if you were a member of the public, you would have never found them. Because when we adopted them, we said we were going to have to incorporate them into our municipal code, and that never happened. That's what the resolution said, that part of that would have been happened. And we didn't make them policy. We adopted them, but we didn't We didn't make them policy. A resolution documents. is policy. What? Yeah, they were, they were adopted. I said they were adopted, but, but they're not labeled as policy documents. They just got a name. They have no date, and they have no revision number. That doesn't mean they don't exist. They exist. But... I, I could not find them if, as a member of the public. I don't believe any member of the public would have ever been able to find them. In fact, earlier today I talked about doing a search for documents and, I, and not coming up with some answers. And the, the words I searched on were norms and protocol and all those other words. So I believe it needs a lot of work. I read it, and I, I agree with, with what's there. 
I believe there's a lot more that needs to be there. For instance, we talked about talking about uh, making it mandatory that people talk about the ex parte uh, um, uh, conversations they have with people who are going to have business in front of the council. And there's many other things. And there's many things in there that I don't comply with. And there are many things in there that no one on this council complies with. And that's the truth. And I don't mean that as an insult. So we either don't understand it or it shouldn't be in there. One of the two. Uh, for instance, there's a whole section on the fact that if the council votes on it, everybody's supposed to uh, support it whether or not they voted on it or not. And we don't, on a regular basis, we don't do that. So one way to get the council to be together again is to is to follow the rules that we apparently adopted a year before I got here. And I think we need an ad hoc committee to do that. And I believe I believe um, uh, that I am uh, well qualified to do that. And I believe I would like to see uh, uh, recommend um, uh, council council. Member Honor Spencer to be the other member of that ad hoc committee. Now, I don't want to. I don't want to start an argument about everything. So I hope the I hope the mayor will uh, will agree. If um, if not, I I have no choice but to use uh, our municipal code and and to make a motion to that effect and ask the council majority to uh, to agree. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other questions or comments on, on that item? I do think the ethics is a very important part of our council. I was surprised that everyone did not get the, the information, the rules in the past. And I'm surprised it's not easily available to the public. There are things that we need to change, and I totally agree. I think one of the things we need to do is identify who we're having conversations with, um, who's lobbying this city, and that should be public information. I really, truly believe all those conversations, those names should be listed. But I think this is an issue that um, I think all of us have concerns about, and I just wanted to know if the council would rather have this as a meeting with all of us involved in this, because I think there's a lot of ideas all of us have to make this better or if the majority of the council believes this should be an ad hoc. So I'm just kind of curious on how Well, I mean, regardless, if it's an ad hoc, it's still going to come to the full council for an amendment. So I can go either way. <clears throat> I think I think maybe Marty's right. I don't know. An ad hoc could, could be useful here to bring back to the full council. Council Member Resendez? It does say that the mayor appoints to the ad hoc committees in these protocols, correct? It does. Just to clarify that. Yeah. All right. And again, this is something I, I think it's a, it is a big conversation. When we did this the prior year, we did create ad hoc, but we all participated by submitting ideas, and that's how we came up with the ethics. So I thought it worked out pretty well in the former year so I think I'd like to see something like that happen again so we're all involved in this conversation so we're not falling back to a um, certain ideas but we're all sharing ideas together uh, I just I wanted just, to add that when on when the new council um, came on I did give you a flash drive and on that flash drive had this, these council norms, the Brown Act, um, and a few other documents that I wanted you to um, know and, and just so you know, I did give it to you. No, yeah. it was there for that. my packet, absolutely. Yeah, but it, it would, it's very, uh, my point was, was sorry, somebody else council speaking. I just want to point out, it seems like there's, it's a little bit of a, there's a lot of a lot of passion, I would say, going in towards this issue. It seems like there's a lot of interest of people that would like to be on the ad hoc committee. I too am passionate about this issue. I'd like to be involved in the process. Why don't we just have the discussion in public? Okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to take take to the podium. No. I have nothing that important to 
point I, is that you're leaving. My, my point is I, I have nothing against doing having the discussion in public. I've always been transparent in that respect. I think it should be done in public. However, I'm the reason I want to do an ad hoc committee is I'm taking the mayor's advice. When I started doing this, the first thing he told me is, if you want to get anything done, do an ad hoc committee. The truth of the matter is, if you do an ad hoc committee, work gets done. If you have to do a committee to the whole, work does not get done, and uh, you can see it. If you go down your agenda, you're going to find shortly the mayor is going to propose doing a, a uh, change to our procedures here concerning how to finance campaigns. You'll notice it does not call for the committee of the whole. It calls for an ad hoc committee to do it. Why? Because an ad hoc committee is more effective. They get the work done. They get it work done faster. And that's why he told me, if you want something done, get an ad hoc committee. So I take it the fact that if something's pushed off to a full committee, what it, what it means is it's not going to get done. As far as being in public, I have no problem with being in public. Uh, I don't ex expect that our uh, committee is going to lock itself in the closet. Uh, I think uh, it ought to solicit ideas from the public. And I like a lot of the things that, that are in the current uh, um, documents that would keep a lot of the things that are in the current documents. But I would like to add some things. I would also like to add some things that would move this, this along. For instance, um, there are many places in California where you only get to speak twice on any question. We don't have that limit here. Are we limiting free speech if we say you can speak five times or are we moving things along? I don't know. I think people need to look into those things. It's very important for me, this ethical question, and especially important, and someone brought it up earlier, of, uh, of accusations of unethical conduct. And if, and if I've been if I've been uh, guilty of unethical conduct, I certainly apologize. Being arrogant may be, <laughs> may be distasteful, but it's not unethical, <laughs> okay? And so if I have been, I apologize. However, I do think that accusing people falsely of, um, of being on the payroll of somebody else is unethical. That's just my opinion. And I don't take it lightly, and I think nobody should. If we want to solve our problems, we've got to move on. And, and I'm hoping that um, the majority, although the um, um, council member Resendez is correct, it says the mayor will appoint uh, the committee, and then it says unless otherwise directed by the council. That is in our municipal code, and anyone can look it up if they doubt what I say. So therefore, the council has a right to overrule the mayor on his appointments. I hope we don't have to do it. I would like to see him cooperate and make this an ad hoc committee and, 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 and do so. Thank you for your time. Well, I'm going to go back to the importance of all of us being involved. Billy, do what? The, the idea of overriding mayor, changing things, that's really not what we should be talking about. What we should be talking about is how do we work together to create a document that we're all comfortable with and we believe in. That's important to me. This is an issue where the public should be involved. And quite frankly, I'd like to see this as an item on a meeting. You're right. I did say ad hoc committees are the way to get things done. But that's only if we don't have any information yet and we're trying to create something new. We have information. What I'd like to see is all the council member giving input, uh, items they like to discuss or items they like to put on to the ethics code at our next meeting or the meeting in, in March. So we're all discussing this together as an item. I think it's a fair way to do it and it's the most transparent way to do it and it allows the public to be involved in that discussion. And I think we get this document out so the public can see it now and then again, submit all our ideas for that meeting and we have that conversation here in the public. Everybody here can come out here and give their input also. There might be things we're missing. Council member? I don't agree. I would like to see an ad hoc committee of Vice Mayor Richmond and Councilwoman uh, 
Spencer. Okay. Okay. Well, if, if there's an assistance on an ad hoc committee, I'm going to appoint Councilmember Sendis and then Councilmember Richmond to that committee. Okay. I'm a, that's acceptable to me. Okay. So, um, at, ne at our next meeting, just to kind of, we'll wrap up this conversation. At our next meeting, um, the council is going to consider uh, um, uh, essentially a, a weekend or a facilitator to come in about middle of April, um, and maybe if the ad hoc committee can get together um, and, and draft these changes, um, they can be reviewed on the second day of that by the entire council in public. Um, and before it actually comes back to the city council for formal adoption, I think it, it kind of marries both of what you're asking for. You get a little bit of an ad hoc committee and then you'll get some discussion mm -hmm. as a group, um, a longer discussion, I should say, um, prior to an actual adoption. So I think it's a good resolution. Could you repeat that date, please? Uh, well, we, we no, don't no, no, actually no. have the date yet, but I, I think we're looking at April 13th and 14th. I was going to ask the council what would be better dates. The two dates I have, um, the facilitators available would be um, the April, the weekend of April 13th, or the weekend of April 27th. Can we not get too far ahead of ourselves on this? Because it's actually going to be on the agenda next time. So. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. All right. We'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about it. I thank time. you for the suggestion. I think it's a good one. Yeah. All right. We're going to move to item. Yeah, well, you have to do that. We'll move to item G7. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this item is uh, regarding the motorcycle rally uh, uh, being talked about for uh, J July 4th weekend of uh, 2020. Um, the, the item is basically to allow us to start working with um, uh, road shows or Randy Burke specifically uh, for a potential uh, uh, contract to operate a rally um, for that year. He, during just initial phone calls with uh, Mr. Burke, um, he was looking for co sort of a three-year uh, uh, commitment or contract with um, the city of Hollister and then potentially two one-year options on the back end of that. Um, I provided um, the council with the resolutions, I believe, from 2014 that talked about a 10-year a commitment by the council. Um, that would kind of go it makes from a timing perspective um, the any sort of commitment or letter of intent that we would sort of um, enter into with the uh, roadshows Inc I want to make sure that I'm, I am very clear that this um, doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be an event in 2020 that contract still needs to be adopted with terms and conditions by the council um, but uh, um, mr. Burke is going to be heading off to um, bike week in Daytona at the first in the first weekend of March and he wanted to be able to have something uh, to talk to his potential sponsors about major sponsors um, and letting them know that this is uh, this is a potential for uh, 2020 and 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 beyond um, as you know uh, we've had long-term contract with the HDA. There's been several issues with various promoters throughout the year, et cetera, uh, throughout the years, I should say, et cetera. Um, but at least at this point, it would give us staff the uh, direction from the council to at least have those initial um, sort of discussions about um, doing a rally. Um, if there's any questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer you. Just I want to make sure that we keep in mind that this is not a commitment to have one, but it certainly is the first step in, in making sure that we have conversations and to make sure that the city and uh, roadshows or Randy Burke, however he's going to be utilizing this, um, whatever names he's going to be using, sometimes they change names, but I just want to let you know that it, it's a good first step for us to have something in 2020. Okay, is there any questions from council members? No. Councilman yeah. Richard, Vice Mayor Richmond. Thank you. I want to make a statement. So uh, one thing's a little confusing about w you know whether we're giving them a contract. We're just talking about giving them a contract. Yes, sir. We're doing okay. Here's here's. I'm a supporter of the rally. I know people people because I'm careful about the public safety and and public the public's purse. But some people don't believe it, but it's true. I, li I really like it. I'd like to be able to support it. I think it's really vitally important that we get on to planning 2020 okay that's my opinion and right away for once not let it let let the planning go down to the last minute and then have all all these issues that that, that pop up that we don't have especially now we have two we have two issues that we've got to solve one is and the, uh, one is related to public safety on how we're going to pay 
or cover um, the workers, as you, as you well know, I won't go into it. And the second one is uh, whether or not we're going to get a acceptable um, nonprofit to essentially act as a buffer, so to depoliticize this issue. I think what we ought to do is commit to doing something in 2020, provided we can solve those problems. And then wait to see how he does in 2020, whether we give him a long-term contract. I think that's really important because 2020 will be the, the key to how things go. Um, we should start right away looking for a solution uh, to, the, to the workers' comp issue, in my opinion, so that we can see what our options are, what it will cost, and the fact that we've got public safety covered. And we should start looking right away to see if we can find a nonprofit. I don't think coming up without a nonprofit, I don't think that's a deal killer. But I think not having workers' comp covered is a deal killer for me. And I would also say we've got to check in with the, with the boss here, the chief, chief of police, to see if he will say, stand up and say, I've got it covered as far as public safety is concerned. I think that's important, and I think we should do it now so we have an early answer on what our options are on that, and we don't take Mr. Burke down to down to the last minute. And that way, he can he he'll have plenty of plenty of um, uh, notice, and he can he can do the do his thing. You know, he can make his plans, and he'll know that we've got him covered. And then, if 2020 is a great success, or even a success, then we know we 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 can cover it. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? <coughs> the only thing I wanted to add, the reason it's very important to have at least a three-year term or longer is because it's very difficult for these promoters to get the sponsors they need for their events. And this is part of the, the conversation I've had with them in the past was, hey, look, love coming to Hollister, love doing this show there, but I can't do this year by year by year. And... This guy is ready to go. He's a, he's a professional act. He just needs to know there's a commitment for him so he can commit to the sponsors, and that's how these things work. It's without the large sponsors, he's not going to do it. And it's you know, he's, he's a very smart guy. He just needs the support of the, the sponsors, and he needs to know that the city is committed to it, and it's not going to be a yearly battle. That's what all he's looking for. And, of course, uh, making sure the... The price is reasonable, so he can get it done without losing money. All of us have to look at that. So I think it's going to be important to at least give him the opportunity to shop it for a three-year, if that's what he's looking for. Th that was what he was looking for. Yeah, yes. and that's going to be an important part of this whole deal here. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, what happens if we can't solve the problem of workers' compensation? I'm just curious. We, we we need to solve the problem. What if we if we say we have a commitment? Is that a contract? Can he sue us and no. say no? No. Oh, okay. No, this is not a contract. So it's not really a commitment. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if it's not a contract, we, we don't we, we're not really committed. We can back out. Just make it clear to him. Yeah, he knows. Yeah. Well, he, I mean, and, that's what it'll yeah, say. and he and he is fully aware of, of that. I think that he, I think going in, he wants to be able to negotiate with us in good faith, uh, us as staff, prior to getting to the council. And like um, you said, Councilman uh, Richmond, uh, there are some. There's no question. There's some hurdles. So if we can cr jump those hurdles together and provide you with a contract that I staff can and chief can uh, uh, recommend to the council, um, it that's what you will get. Thank you. As long as and there's we'll, a bailout, yeah. if, if and we'll, we can't come up with a solution, we can't have the rally, in my opinion. Uh, I could get outvoted, and we could have the ballot rally anyway. Mm -hmm. I just would like to see that in the contract. Yeah. Yeah. And, we, and we will start immediately, because I will say this is the first time ever that we've been able to at least begin something like this for a year, at, a year and a half out. So, so, so maybe that's thank good. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any speaker cards? Okay, so this is an action item? A resolution? Okay. It's a consensus. I don't see yeah, a for, no resolution. For some reason, I had written a resolution, but I may have screwed up and I didn't actually attach it, so I apologize. Can we do a consensus? But you can do a consensus, that, and I can let um, 
I can let him know. Okay. Is there a Thank consensus you. from the council? Yes. There's a consensus. To I'm still learning work. our system, too, I promise. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's tricky, so. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Let's move to item G8. This is the ad hoc for flavored tobacco. I see some very patient people here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Chewing on gum, right? Um, this is a, an item that's been before us a few times. It's very important for our community. And the, the information that's being gathered and presented, it's, it's important for us to have this information. I do want to create an ad hoc and appoint two members. I would like to appoint Council Member Spencer and Council Member Lenore to this ad hoc if they'd be willing to serve on it. Yes. To work with yes. this fine group of, of people. I very here. much look forward to it. And um, can't wait. Come back and give us uh, and, uh, your opinion or view. And I believe it would be okay with the council that our youth committee would like to select uh, three members of its group to participate with the council on the drafting of this. So um, they'd awesome. be really excited about that. I love young people getting involved. Okay. okay excellent. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move to item nine. I have speakers on oh, we do G8. Have speakers on yes. Oh, yeah. See, I'm just. They, waited for a they have been waiting patiently. They waited for I, a reason. I thought this is where you say yes and you move on. Okay. Yvette Robledo and Ariana Fabian. Hello. Uh, my name is Ariana Fabian, and I just want to thank you guys for having us here tonight. And I, uh, I'm a junior at San Benito High School. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Yvette Robledo, and I am also a junior here at San Benito High School. We are here today because we are frustrated. We feel like it's a cat and mouse game, and things are just being dragged on. Parents are being blamed for us youth having access to flavored tobacco products, but that is not the case. It's the stores. The summer going into my freshman year, I, along with my eight-year-old sister and my 14-year-old friend, walked into the Green Rush Moog Shop downtown. I can definitely say that I was nervous as I, I was aware that I was not allowed to be in that area. But to my surprise, we, the vendor ended up selling me and my friend a vape pen along with, well, it wasn't even like he sold it to us. He gave us two free um, vape juices. And I remember as walk, as we were walking out, he, he told us our goodbye. And he I, rem, I can just remember him saying that he didn't want us to, like, tell anybody that he was the one selling it because he could get into so much trouble and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But, yeah, that was just one of my experiences at a smoke shop. So three hours ago, I, a 16-year-old, went inside Smoker Paradise, a 21 and over retailer, and I purchased these two items. And this was my first experience personally going inside a smoke shop, and it surprised me on how easily accessible it is to purchase these items or any other potential harmful things to myself. Um, what's the point of having 21 and old, 21 and older? Um, retailer stores if our youth or myself can purchase these items. Here I have an ordinance. What else more do we need? Thank you. Thank you. Diana Villa and Elaine Nariso. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Diana Avila. And my name is Celine Narciso, and, here, and we're here with Public Health Services. So my initial thought was going back to um, an April 2018 meeting and how, actually I was going to read over the minutes on how a committee, ad hoc committee was established to address the flavor tobacco issues. However, after um, moving forward to appointing um, senior, I'm sorry, councilwoman, Honor Spencer and Councilor, Ca I'm sorry, Councilwoman Carol Leonard <laughs> to uh, take on this committee. I, th um, I would um, move forward, and I'm very looking forward to it, and I hopefully will go forward to this, and we don't go back another year and try to form another ad hoc committee and then just leave it there and not take it any further because I feel like it's kind of like a hot potato. We're moving it like to 
I don't know, whoever, and we leave, and it, we just leave it out like that. So we want to take action on this, and what are we going to do? Because it is our responsibility, and shame on us if we don't go forward on any of this. So we're concerned because, as Diana said, a committee was appointed in April 2018, and we don't know what happened after that, because as far as we know, this is what we know. After April 2018, in California, 14 jurisdictions have had their first reading, they've had their second reading, and they've passed a policy, including our neighbors, the city of Santa Cruz. We also know that the Surgeon General and the FDA have called youth vaping an epidemic. The American Academy of Pediatrics has called for the ban of these flavored tobacco products, including menthol. And here in Hollister, 324. 324 of San Benito High School students used vaping devices. And this is according to the California Healthy Kids Survey. Here in Hollister, we reached out to the city in 47 different occasions in regards to this issue, and we feel like we are still in square one. But after what the mayor just said, we're hopeful that with this new ad hoc committee, we actually will get something done. Thank you. Thank you. Can we make a Dr. Call? Mark Friedman? Oh, Marty. 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 Friedman. I'm sorry, Marini Friedman. Sorry. Good evening, City Council members. I'm Dr. Marnie Friedman. I'm a family medicine physician in Hollister, the community of Hollister, for almost 20 years. And I've been on the first five San Benito Commission for most of that time. So the question of youth uh, use of nicotine and tobacco products is a big concern in my medical practice. And when I was asked to, uh, by the Public Health Department to address this issue to the City Council, I did a quick look through my, the American Academy of Family Practice literature and discovered that you actually don't need an ad hoc committee. All the work has already been done. And this is a big hot button issue for both the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Practice, and the Surgeon General. Um, I pared down everything I printed out from about three inches to um, a, few, a few pages. I found out what I already knew, which is that the adolescent pe time period is a very vulnerable time for initiation of exposure to tobacco products and nicotine that if you start using any kind of nicotine product as a teenager, you are very likely to become addicted, that the majority of people who smoke or use any kind of nicotine product in adulthood are most likely to have started as a young adolescent, um, that the flavored tobacco products are specifically designed to target and addict the youth, that the tobacco industry is looking for these vulnerable populations to be the next generation of smokers. These vulnerable populations include rural people, women, uh, sexual identity minorities, young people. They're not going after the, the uh, Marlboro man anymore, the, the straight white man. They're going after these subgroups of people, the mentally ill, groups of people that are more easily addicted, the lower socioeconomic classes, and youth. If you can hook a kid who's 14 or 15 with a bubblegum or fruity flavored END, which is the electronic nicotine delivery system, you have a lifetime smoker. Um, the amount of nicotine that is absorbed from these devices can create a blood level that is higher than from uh, a typical lit cigarette and ca can cause an early and severe addiction to nicotine. And uh, we know that smoking and nicotine causes damage to almost every body part, um, that addiction is early and swift. And truly, nicotine is the gateway drug. The, the use and reward uh, feedback that happens in the brain of an adolescent is very similar to the reward and use system that uh, exists with use of other substances. So it's not a coincidence that young people who smoke are young people that use other substances. So I don't think there's any question about where to go with this. We need to limit access uh, for young people to nicotine and discourage products that cater towards them. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have no more speakers, Mr. Mayor. Okay, any questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I have a question. 
You know, um, when uh, it was a butane uh, was uh, was an issue. Did we have a butane uh, emergency butane ban? I thought it was yeah, butane. Yes, yes, we did. Could uh, are we uh, could we have an emergency ban on flavored tobacco products and vaping products for for uh, certain uh, things that would give us ninety days to uh, look into. Uh, um, into getting uh, the ordinance written and uh, and out, uh, maybe not today because it's not on the agenda. I'm just asking, could we do that? Now we're, we're on to three meetings a month. We don't have to wait three weeks. Uh, can we have an emergency ban? Is that? I'm not suggesting that we get a vote on it tonight. It's not on the agenda. My question is, is it within our power to do that? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, you, you could agendize the, um, uh, the existence of an emergency. In other words, the, the council would have to make those findings that the, this is so out of control um, that it requires immediate action by the council. That would, could come back at the next meeting um, and, and then move forward with an emergency ordinance at that time, which would take effect immediately. I propose that we bring it back at the next meeting for emergency, uh, consideration of emergency ban of flavored tobacco products and vape, vapor products in, in a way that makes, uh, that more, more securely ensures that uh, it's not available to underage uh, users. Can we bring it back for that? Okay. You'd like to, uh, Ms. Richmond is asking to agendize that item in a future meeting. The, that would be February or March. So or, I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong here, everybody. <laughs> this, what, I'm, what I'm about to say is, is, is not necessarily a philosophical thing. It's more of a practical issue that we have. Um, the practical issue, <laughs> right? The practical issue is, is that if you come at, um, uh, if, if we draft an urgency ordinance that is adopted, what does that urgency ordinance look like? Um, again, I think why it's important to have the ad hoc committees because the ad hoc committee is not only going to establish the rules and regulations on, on which these products may or may not be sold. I'm not saying that there, there may be a full outright ban um, in the city limits. And that's why I think the ad hoc committee is important to sort of figure out where we go. I, I understand one of the things that we always that I always go back to is this, is that there's 482 cities in the state of California and there's 58 counties and there's still less than 10% that have some sort of regulation on that. There's, I understand there's a, there's a, health and a, a healthy side of this and there's and a youth perspective to this, but there's also a huge other side of this that the council needs to be cognizant of when they're making these decisions. And I think that, I think that having the ad hoc committee, um, it allows you to go through that process properly and, and make an educated and, and a good decision with as you say, a lot of times with the input of the community to determine which is the best direction for this council to go. So, Council Member uh, Essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, we can have an ad hoc committee, we can have one meeting, and as Dr. Friedman pointed out, all the information's there. The two councilwomen that are appointed to the ad hoc can come back, bring it back sooner, rather than going out there, creating a new ordinance for a ban. Oh, oh, can sure. we get it done quicker on an ad hoc committee? I'm just, I'm just trying to yeah, absolutely. Not double our work as, here. As, as, you know, we have samples of several communities. We have samples of their ordinances. So the creation of the ordinance is really pretty simple. Um, again, this, the, is the decision going to be a ban or some sort of limited or restricted sales? Um, and if it's a limited or restricted sales, then there's a, just a few blanks that we got to figure out. What are the sensitive uses? How far away do you have to be? And, and so on. So uh, it, it shouldn't take much more than maybe a one good meeting or two meetings. Um, I think that where I would say the only caveat in there is that, you know, if we have the proponents of, of an option for the outright ban or, you know, does this council or the ad hoc committee want to hear from the store owners, uh, from other people who partake in this sort of activity and what, what, does that, what is that going to mean to them? So it allows there to be both sides. So I'm not going to say it could be done in one meeting. Probably two is more likely, to be honest with you. But um, it could be done quickly. It shouldn't be something that's long and drawn out because they are absolutely right. Um, other communities have done a ban or a, you know, have regulations and ordinances already adopted. So we don't ever reinvent the wheel. We usually steal what we can from other communities. Borrow. Borrow. <laughs> well, since it's not on the since it's, since uh, action is not on the agenda except for appointment of ad hoc committee, 
we certainly can't take any action tonight. The fact that we might consider an emergency ban might get the store owners in here. Uh, <laughs> I okay. can promise you, you say that. Okay, be in might here. get them in here. So, you know, um, uh, which might serve a purpose in and of itself. I'm not, I'm not, at this point in time, I'm not saying that I am supporting an emergency ban. What I'm saying is, how do we get it on the agenda? Uh, what what are our, what are our legal uh, authority to do so, and can we look at it? It certainly doesn't eliminate the ad hoc committee or tell them to stop working or any such thing. But what it does is it gives a certain push, certain push to yeah, it. I hear you. <laughs> I understand. Councilmember Lenore. Thank you, Mayor. I I just want to state that. Um, let me let me just say this that I spent 30, 40, 33 years working in county and city government. My motto was the buck stops here. I rarely pass things on and I like government to, to run a little faster than it does. But I'm going to be honest with you. I represent the commercial district downtown. I have to be looking at both sides. That's how it works. I can't just listen to one side. So when I go through the course of this, you know, I will be listening uh, to the retailers uh, and also to all of the youth. Uh, but I got to tell you that uh, we'll solve this and we'll get something done. And this will be the last ad hoc committee that you're going to have to confront with. Because again, I never pass on things. I like this to finish things and the buck stops here. I don't think she's any different than me either. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you two were chosen. <laughs> and I think it is important to um, let the ad hoc committee do the research, understand what they are doing in Santa Cruz and some of the neighboring communities, sure. because it's really important. If we do something here and they're not doing something next in the next city, the problem continues. They so go there. They drive over there. That research would be very important. I would like to say something really quick. Yeah. Okay. We just wanted to know if it was okay in the meantime if we can give what we drafted to the city manager. Absolutely. It's, it's actually modeled after Santa Cruz's policy, which they just passed oh, in November. Absolutely. Cool. Thank Would you, you happen to have a copy you. for me? <laughs> He'll make you one. Make you so we'll let the ad hoc committee do their work, work with you guys directly, I'm sure, and uh, our youth committee members. All right? Awesome. So this thank is you for waiting. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to item G9, and that's the formation of a campaign finance reform committee, which I think is a very important item also, and everybody's leaving. They don't want to hear about it. <laughs> but what I would like to do is I would like to appoint um, Council Member Spencer and myself to that committee. I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Thank you. There's no speakers on this one, I guess. Nope. HIJK and uh, Vice Mayor Richmond would like to adjourn in memory of a service member. Thank you. Um, I would like to adjourn tonight in, in memory of uh, my neighbor here in Hollister, uh, Ed Krominga, who, who passed away in late January of, of this year. It is World War II vet. He was shot down over Italy on his 34th mission in a B-24 and spent the rest of the war a few months in a, in a German POW camp. He's a hell of a guy. He was a hell of a guy. And he's got a hell of a, hell of a wife who's still alive. Uh, Dorothy, and I want to I want to adjourn in his memory because people like him made it possible to have government like this. Thank you. Thank you. A motion. I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn in honor of Ed Crominga, resident of Hollister, former resident. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Okay. Mm -hmm.